introduce to you Brother Keola. Thank you, Victorino. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you. Praise God. Woo. No, don't. Man, praise God. Praise God. We give him all the praises today. We give Jesus all the praises today. For some of you, you guys are visiting today, and I thank you that you come. Man, I'm encouraged by you. I'm encouraged by your faith. And for the Abba family, man, you guys have just welcomed me and my family. You know, I tried to pull in, and they made me park in the front row. I'm like, trying, I'm like no, I can park way out there. They brought me right there. And, and man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But if you are visiting and you don't know, you are in the presence of God and some real people. You are in the presence of God and some real people. Again, my name is Kiola Victorino. That's just the name I was given. Uh, in fact, uh, my first name is Jerome, and I met Jerome out in the parking lot. So we're kindred spirits. We're kindred spirits already. Uh, but man, when I, when I think about, you know, meeting, uh, I, I love the story because she was, I mean, there were puddles. I mean, that, like tears. I mean, one tear after another. And man, I was sitting there going, Lord, I don't deserve any of this to be in, in her presence and just to what the Lord was doing in that office. But again, if you guys don't know, uh, if you guys don't know, we got, you know, Pastor Matisha, Pastor James, they are some real people. Amen. They are some real people. They're living it out, living out their calling. You're right. It's just it's not just something here on the wall that they're putting up some some cool messages that they put up on the wall. They live it out. Right. And, you know, for, and what, what's been cool is I've been seeing you. Many of you guys faithfully come into our Tuesday nights. Like, like she was saying, you know, we're at the Raleigh Dream Center right around the corner, right around the corner, walking distance from here. And you'll see again a lot of our folks here, um, our DCD guys, man, they, they, they walk through these parking lots. Yes. Amen. Amen. And it's, it's been great, right, being a part of it and then seeing, you know, your family come on out, right? I mean, you have a, a, a leadership a leadership crew here that, again, are living it out. You got Pastor Teresa, you got uh, Pastor Tiffany, Pastor Rod, right? Sister Bettina, man, I see her all every Tuesday night. And if you don't know what Tuesday night family night is, what we do is we go down to Moore Square. We'll evangelize to, to a lot of our fam from the streets. We'll bust them into the Dream Center. We'll have a meal. We'll have a great time of, of worship. And then, of course, it can't be anything without the Word of God. Amen. Right? Because if we just provide a meal, we're just providing meals. Right? We're not, we're not a food ministry. We are a Jesus Christ ministry is what we are. Amen. 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 So when Pastor Matisha asked me to speak, I, was, I sat and I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, what do they need? What do real people need? Right? Is there something they need to know? Is there something they need to know from your word, Lord? Is there something that you're calling them to do, Lord? What do they need? Well, what about wants? Maybe they want to hear it's the Christmas spirit. You know, we got all the, the Christmas decorations. Maybe they want to hear some Christmas message from me. I don't know, Lord. What do they need? Maybe you have kids, and because Christmas is here, you've constantly heard that, hey, I need this. I need that. I need that new Xbox. I need those new Jordans that came out. Dad, I need this. Well, is it a want or is it a need? You see, because wants, wants kind of, it just more deals with our desires. Whereas needs deal with our necessities. So what do we need? I think about a story of a lady named Shannon. Shannon, uh, she, she, you'll see her out here, um, and I, I don't know if she came. I, I've seen her a couple weeks ago. I haven't seen her since. She said she might come. She's, I don't think she's in the room, but she said it's okay to share this story. But So we, we have a Tuesday night one night, and she comes in, and I'm the first person she sees. And she says, hey, sir, um, you know, I just left an abusive relationship. All I have with me is the clothes that are on my back. She goes, all I want is just a couple dollars, and I'll be out of your hair. Of course, we're not a cash ministry, right? Now, if I had cash on me, I may have gave, you know, thought, hey, Lord, I, t I tell our people all the time, we're not a cash ministry, but if the Lord tells you to give that cash up, you better respond, right? We can't hold on to it tightly, right? So she comes to me, she says that, and I say, hey, listen, I don't have any cash, but what we do have is we have a clothing ministry outside. I got a hot meal for you. 
We got the word, we got some worship, and I got somebody that can pray for you. Can we just start there? So she comes in, she gets prayed for, she gets a hot meal, she goes out to the clothing ministry, she gets clothing, and what was so cool is she comes out, she had, you know, just t-shirt, shorts, dirty, she comes out of the bathroom, she's got a beautiful dress on, and you could just see a glow in her. And after the evening happened, she comes up to me and she said, hey, Kiola, I just want you to know, man, I thought I needed just some cash to get out of here, but the Lord provided everything that I needed in that day. Amen. 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 So that's where, if that doesn't compel you, I know, you know, I, I, it's, on, it's on your Facebook page, it's in your schedules. If you have not been to Tuesday night, then I want to encourage you. Maybe this is the push that you need to come on down. All right? Amen. And then I also hear adopt a block is right around the corner for Abba Worship Center. Yep. We'll save that for another day. But today, in the scripture that we're going to be in today, we're going to see a few of our needs or our necessities as the word shows it to us. But I do believe there is one need that we all have. It's not only essential, but I believe it is our greatest need. You see, we may not get what we want until we get what we need first. So today we're going to be in the book of Mark. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in the book of Mark. It's chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, we know that the Gospel of Mark, right, it's a simple book. And like I always like to tell folks as I help them, you just got to go read it. It's not enough just for me to read it to you. It's not enough just for, you know, your parents to read it to you, your your pastors to read it to you. You got to go read it for yourself, right? It's the shortest of the four Gospels. It's packed with just this descriptive detail as, as if you were sitting right there experiencing it with them. Being a witness firsthand. And then throughout the book, we see the humanity of Jesus. And Mark 10, 45, what does he say? He, he shows the suffering servant, Jesus as a suffering servant. He says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You see, being a servant, serving others, it comes at a cost. For you, it it. it to serve and to come out to the Raleigh Dream Center, it might cost you something. It might cost you convenience. It might cost you time, right? Feeding the hungry. It might cost you something. But we know what with Jesus serving, being a suffering servant, we knew what that cost him, right? It cost him his life, right? You see, Jesus knew his purpose when he came here willingly. Jesus knew what the mission was. And I'm here to tell you, real people, you have purpose. Are you on mission is the question. Hmm. I want to know maybe what's holding you back from being fully sold out. Real people for real people, saving the lost at any cost. Right? That's just not just some cute thing on the door. It's something we live out. There's a world that's hurting out there right outside these doors. And we need to reach them at any cost. But what's keeping you from doing that? What's keeping you from doing that? What's holding you back? Right? I even thought about this other, you know, I love that, reaching the lost at any cost. What about chasing the strays who are long or gone for days? Right? You've got some people we haven't seen in a long time. If that's you, I praise God that you're here today. Praise God that you're here today. Let's start next week. We've got, we got a street going. And then we'll just keep going. Right? So when we look at Mark, he jumps right in. He starts with John the Baptist. He got Jesus' baptism, right? He starts his ministry. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. You see, Jesus starts teaching in the synagogues, right? And he's one who teaches with authority, the Bible says. He wasn't like the other teachers, the the scribes, the other teachers of the law, right? He cleanses a leper. We see that in there. He cleanses a leper. And then uh, he he tells that guy, go tell, you know, hey, go go tell, uh, you know, don't go telling anybody. And then what happens? Right? The guy, of course, can't, uh, he can't hold, hold back. He tells everybody. 
right? And then what happens? Jesus goes viral. In today's world, I guess that would be the word. But when I think of that, it's like, whoa, when they want, everybody started coming to Jesus. He couldn't go into a desolate, he'd go into desolate places and they would follow him. They'd be all over looking for him and they'd find him. And I always, again, I wonder what was it that they wanted? Maybe they wanted to see miracles for themselves. Maybe they wanted to get heal, healing from some type of infirmity or, or healing from some type of sickness. Regardless of what anyone wanted, though, Jesus provided and provides what they need. Amen. All right? Amen. So let's go ahead and read. We're going to stand up and read Mark. I know everybody just sat down. <laughs> I need my glasses. I might be asking for a miracle after this for uh, to see. All right, let's start. Chapter 2, verses 1, and it says, And he returned to Capernaum. After some days it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let the bed down in which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes, they were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. That's the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Father in heaven, God, I thank you, Lord. Your word is living Father, open our eyes to what you have for us in this word, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that, that you give us your word so that we can, we can uh, just be under your teaching, that we could talk to you, be in communication with you, Lord. If we want to know about you, we need to open this great book that you have provided, God breathed. So, Father, I praise you. Lord, I, I think about this right now. It's, it, it's, it's not about a building, Lord. It's about a body. This is all about a body, a body that, that was beaten, mocked, scorned, a body that was, was, was buried, but a body that was risen from the grave. It's about a body of believers who are going out, reaching the loss at any cost, Lord. So, Lord, I praise you and I thank you, Lord. Show us our greatest need through your word this morning. And it is in your mighty name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. 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 So we'll start out in verse... Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, let's start out, it reads, And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was home. Jesus was in the house. And I believe Jesus is in the house today, this morning. Amen? Now they say this is most likely the house of Peter. And it says, And many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. So like I said, with Mark, it gets pretty vivid. You can put yourself in, in the, you know, right there as if you're experiencing it. So imagine you're there. The house is crammed, you're shoulder to shoulder, there's no room, right? You got, probably have people up on the windows looking in, what's going on, right? You see, everyone wanted to see Jesus. And what was he doing? Well, it says he was preaching the word to them. You see, the word was preaching the word. So here's one need that we all have. Real people must hear the word of God preached. You see, it's not enough to just to want to hear the word. It's not enough to just have our Bibles sitting on a coffee table, right? We got to open that word up, right? Real people, we need to sit under its preaching and teaching. So yes, we need you here on Sundays to hear the preaching and teaching. But there, we got to remind you, there's also another six days and... Or what is it, six days and 48 hours, something like that. 
<laughs> six days and 23 hours. Let's go. Depends on worship here. Man, we already, we're already we already, what, two hours in, in our day, right? Sunday school, you got to be there, man. If you didn't come to Sunday school, this room didn't have this many people in Sunday school this morning. Amen. So next week, let's see you in Sunday school. Amen. Because, man, it was a good message. Amen. Pastor James brought something good. Amen. All right? I'm not even going to tell you about it because you got to just show up. Amen. All right? But, yes, it's not periodically. Where's our blessed people at? Amen. 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 Right. Well, Psalm one says, in, in, you know, in, in the spirit of, of reading God's word and being in God's word, Psalms one says the blessed person meditates on his law, on his instruction day and night. And what's the result of it? He's like a tree planted near streams of water. Right. He yields fruits in its season and its leaves do not wither. And, and all that he does, this is never ending in all that he does. He prospers. Who wants to prosper this morning? We're looking to prosper, right? Well, if we look at that too, this is a prospering that money cannot buy. This isn't Midas touch. You know, everything I touch turns to gold, right? This is more peace, more joy. Again, prospering that money cannot buy. You see, we need the inspired word of God. Amen. And then we, do, we don't need to not just, we don't need to just immerse ourselves in it, but then we need to do what it says. Right? James 1, 22. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Right? So again, as Jesus is preaching the word with authority, he says, And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and then they could not get near him because of the crowd. They removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Like I said, I, I worked in corporate America interviewed a lot of folks, hired a lot of folks, things like that. And when I would do interviews, what I would do is I would look at three different categories of people. You got your quitters, you got your campers, and you got your climbers. When you look at quitters, quitters don't even try. They look up at a mountain, they see how big that mountain is, they're not even going to try, right? Then you got your campers. A camper might look at the mountain and say, you know what, I can do that. They climb a little bit, and then all of a sudden, they camp out. It gets too hard. Eventually, I would, I would say they go from a camper to a quitter. Well, then you got your climbers. Your climbers, they look up at a mountain. They see how big it is. They see how treacherous it is. They see how many people have failed. They look at that mountain and they say, whatever the cost, I'm getting to the top of that mountain. So what kind of person are you? Are you a climber? Yes. Amen. Right? When it comes to sharing Jesus, do you not even try because it's hard? Do you, maybe you got the attitude of, I'll share Jesus as long as they ask, then I'll share. My question to that is, are they even asking? Right? Are you carrying, a, you know, do, do, they, do they follow you or do they ask you because of the banner you represent in Jesus Christ? Or are they asking you about what you think about current events, who you voted for? Where do you shop? All those kinds of things. Right? Or are you that climber, whatever it costs, even if it costs you your time, even if it costs you your convenience. Again, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm not here just to, to uh, promote the Raleigh Dream Center. Easy opportunity right around the corner. But if the Lord calls you to a di in a different direction to serve his kingdom, are you willing to say yes? Again, we got an easy, easy in for you right around the corner. Pastor Matisha is there too, leading the way, right? But what kind of person are you when it comes to sharing Jesus and getting the gospel out? You see, when the going gets tough, do you shy away? Or when the Lord presents an opportunity, was it 1 Peter 3.15? Are you always prepared to share the hope that you have? You see, we're not asking you to take this, take this Bible and hit it people up on the heads, right? Preach a doom and gloom type of thing. I can tell you our DCD guys here, our Dream Center Discipleship guys, you know, all, it's just simple for them to just share their stories of how their life was before Jesus, how they met Jesus, and then how Jesus changed their lives. So you can take that, that simple way of sharing your story. Because sometimes then you might say, well, hey, kill the man. Usually I only got a few minutes with somebody. 
I can't share, you know. I, I got to sit down and I got to dissect the word. Not, not, here, it's real simple. How was your life before Jesus? How you met Jesus? And how Jesus changed your life? Amen? Amen. So these four men, when I think of these four men, I think of these four friends, they were climbers. You see, they didn't let the crowd uh, deter them from sh getting their friends to Jesus, right? Getting their one friend to Jesus. They didn't look at the crowd and say, hey, maybe next time. Next time we'll show up, right? We'll try another time when it's more convenient. What they do is they climb up on the rooftop. Now, some of you, you might sit there, that's, you know, that's pretty crazy. Well, the rooftop back then is no different than kind of our, our uh, back patio, our back porch or whatnot. They actually would use rooftops back then to, to hang out, right? Maybe some of you know this one in, in, uh, in Proverbs. My wife's here. Um, but, you know, what does it say in Proverbs? It says, it's better, to, it's better to sit on the corner of a rooftop than to be with a nagging wife. <laughs> right? It's, the Bible says it, not me. But so people did hang out on the rooftop. It wasn't, it wasn't strange or uncommon to see that. Now, when we look at the roof back then, they, they built these roofs real thick and sturdy because you had to sit on there. So it was a bunch of mud, uh, some thatch and whatnot. And the one thing uh, I want to, again, we talked about, we need, the first thing we needed was we need to be under God's word. Well, if taking from this, the second thing we need, real people need good friends. Right? And let's take it one further. Real, ne real people need to be good friends. Friends that will re remove any barriers to get their friends to Jesus. Anything. Whatever the cost. So my question to you is, who are you hanging out with? Right? Are, 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 you, are you hanging out with people that are life-giving? People that support you? People that will, will speak truth to you when we're in times of where we want to do our own thing? Right? Who are you fighting for? Who are you interceding for? Now imagine at this point, Jesus is preaching. Clumps start falling from the ceiling, kind of like here, if all of a sudden it started rattling and you see these lights come falling down, right? I can imagine Peter sitting there going, you know, it's his house. Like, hey, what's going on up there? You know, who's doing that to my roof? How am I going to pay for that? I quit, I quit fishing because, because of Jesus. How am I going to pay for that, to fix that roof, right? So they make, it, make an opening in the roof big enough to lower their friend. They let him down. And what does it say? Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith. Let's stop there. Jesus sees their faith. The question I asked myself, I was like, well, was it all four of them? Did the paralytic have faith as well? You know, was it his idea? Did he ask the four guys, hey, can you take me? Or did these four guys just, against his will, pick him up and say, we're going to get you to Jesus? Right? Whose idea was it? Well, so Jesus sees their faith. And what does he say? He says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Hmm. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, in the Greek here, that word son, it's this enduring term, but it means a child living in willing dependence. You see, the faith that Jesus saw was fully and willingly dependent on the Lord. And then maybe I, you know, I asked that question. I said, well, what depended for what? Well, surely he wanted their friend to be healed of his paralysis, right? That's what he was there for. Can you imagine, right? The, the, the roof open, you see their heads down, you got four guys smiling, they're all excited, they drop their friend down, they're, they're, they're waiting to see Jesus heal him, and all of a sudden he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, what? whoa, no, we didn't bring him here for that. <laughs> no, no, hey, hey, Jesus, we want you to heal him first, that's what we brought him here for, right? But you see, Jesus didn't just see his outward appearance. As we all know, Jesus knows his heart. Jesus knows your heart. You see, Jesus addressed his greatest need first. And here's the last point. The greatest need of real people, the greatest need of all people is forgiveness. 
You see, too many of us right now, we're walking around in guilt and shame, right? Our past, right? Maybe you've, you've prayed it to God and, and the you know, enemy keeps whispering it back to you, keeps bringing it back, change, trying to change your identity. For those of you that are in Christ Jesus, right? Some of us, we want the circumstances of our lives to change. We want it fixed, but it's the heart that we need cleaned first. We need a circumcision of the heart. And it, it, it's like Pastor James said in Sunday school about we always want to be in comfort. Circumcision is nothing comfortable about that. <laughs> right? It hurts. It's a cutting. It's blood involved in it. But it's all about the blood of Jesus that washes over us in forgiveness. So when we look at it now, it says... Now, some of the scribes were sitting there. They're questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, one of the first things I thought here is, man, who keeps letting these guys in? They got front row seats all the time, right? And while they're sitting there, they're always critical. They're always looking to trap him. Eventually, they play a part in his crucifixion, Right? You see, the, the scribes had this like superiority about them, right? They were, they were better than everyone else. They were teachers of the law. They studied it. They wrote it down. They preserved it. They knew it, head knowledge, but they didn't know it in their hearts. You see, man-made traditions, all of a sudden, it starts to take priority over the word of God with these guys, right? Tradition was more important than truth. They were more concerned with pleasing man than pleasing God. So I asked that question, what about you? When it comes to sharing Jesus, are you, are you more concerned with pleasing man and, and stepping on someone's toes, which keeps you from bringing your friends to Jesus? You see, friends, there is a world out there right now that we live in that are believing lie after lie. We're being pressed by an evil world system which distracts us from getting our friends to Jesus. It distracts us from getting into God's word. Right? What is the, what is the word? It says, uh, well, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's right. right? I think about when I think about getting our friends to Jesus, I think about this story. There's a, I don't know if anybody knows Penn Gillette. His name is Penn Gillette. He's a um, pen and teller. Uh, he's a magician and he's a professed atheist. And he had a story where this guy gave, gives, you know, went out of his way to give him a Bible. And he just, was, he just thought that that was just a profound thing. He was like, man, how, how nice of this guy. He knows I'm an atheist, but he went out of his way, brought me a Bible. What a sweet guy. And he says this. He says, how much do you have to hate someone to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them? He's an atheist. And I pray that one day he would read that book that he was given. So when an opportunity arises to bring truth, to lead someone to their greatest need of forgiveness, eternity is at stake. What are you questioning in your heart? It says, now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, the scribes aren't wrong because the only one that can forgive sins is God alone, right? And it says here, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? So they're sitting there. They got the rock eyebrow going on. That's what that one's for Pastor Rod, right? They got the rock eyebrow going on. They're like, you know, RPF, resting Pharisee face, right? They're, they're, they're just like, what is this guy doing? He's, he's um, you know, he's forgiving sins. He's blaspheming, right? And I love how Jesus always likes to answer a question with a question, even the question is not verbally asked, right? He says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? What do you think is easier? Your sins, in, your sins are forgiven has to be easier, right? Because what if he says, hey, rise, take up your bed, and walk, and the guy's still paralyzed, right? Everyone would know that he doesn't have the power to heal, you see, no one can test or see sins forgiven. So that would be easier to say 
but has Jesus ever taken the easy way out? Right? In the presence of the scribes, everyone else, it would be easier to say, take up your mat and walk. Because by saying your sins are forgiven, Jesus is claiming to be God. And the scribes know it, and everybody else there knows it too. So if you're sitting there now, you're sitting there going, man, okay, this is all going on. I would ask the question, man, why would he do that? Because every single time it, that somebody finds out about this, it's one more step towards the cross, right? Why would he do this? What's the point? Well, here's what he says. He says, so that, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says, here's why I said it. Not just to heal him from his physical needs, you see, you've heard about it. He's like, you've seen me heal before. This time he addresses this man's deepest need, his release from guilt and shame, his need for forgiveness of sin, because that was way more important than his paralysis. Now, I want to be very clear. His paralysis wasn't a punishment of his sin, which many believe that back then. You know, that sickness was a punishment of sin. You know, they got the blind man in John 9, right? And they asked, when the disciples asked him, hey, who sinned, him or his parents, right? You see, this, this man's paralysis may have been a consequence of his sin. One pastor I heard talk about this. He, 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 he was thinking that maybe it was, it was uh, syphilis or something, right? So his paralysis may have been a consequence of his sin of sleeping around, but it wasn't a punishment handed down by God, right? You see, our suffering in this world is not because we sin, although suffering entered the world because of sin. And maybe we ask the question, well, why do we suffer? Why is there death? Well, we know the word tells us, well, Adam sinned, right? And then his sin is charged to all mankind. That's not fair, right? But then our sin is charged to Jesus. And in his abounding grace, his much more grace, is charged, credited to us. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15, 22, In Adam we all die, so all in Christ we shall all be made alive. And that's all that, all that is to say is that this man's sin problem was deeper than his paralysis, and his greatest need was forgiveness. So verse 10, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, that you may know that God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, has the authority. You see, Jesus is the Son of Man. And we see this reference in the, in the New Testament about 84 times as Jesus referenced as the Son of Man. And that's, um, that, I think that, that's second to Lord and Christ when you read that in, in the New Testament. But Son of Man is number one when it comes from Jesus' lips as to who he was. You see, maybe you think of that term son of man and you think that portrays the, the humanity of Jesus. And yes, it does. But it also portrays his power, his authority. Daniel 7, 13, 14, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the cloud of heaven, there came one like a son of man. There it is. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. I think that was in our second song today, the first or second song. And I was sitting there going, oh man. So when Jesus uses this term, son of man, he's not just speaking with humility. He's not sitting here going, hey, I get you. I'm a man just like you. He's not just saying that. Again, this is his claim to his divine authority. He is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not, was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Only God can forgive sins. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, God wants to heal you of your greatest need. 
today. And all we need to do is repent, turn away, turn from our wicked ways, and believe. Amen? So my question to you right now, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to work. What unconfessed sins are you holding on to this morning? Let's take time right now, right where you are. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to just move. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what unconfessed sins you're holding on to this morning. It may hurt. But he wants to heal you of that this morning. We've got a lot of space up here. If you want to come on up, you have the cross. We can just leave it at the cross today. Ask the Holy Spirit, shine that light onto your sin. You see, when we sin, we sin against God. Right? And only God can forgive sin. Even sin against someone else. Right? With, with my wife, when I sin against her, right? She may forgive me when I ask for forgiveness. But I still need to take it for, to God. It's all good and necessary to ask for her forgiveness. But we need God's forgiveness. Because like I said, all sin is against God. Leave it at his feet today. Maybe you're sitting here, you're going, hey, Kiola, man, you just don't know what I've done. I need to forgive myself first. How long is it going to take you to do that? Maybe this is the next step. When the Lord teaches us to pray, he says, ask, you know, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Is there someone that you need to forgive? Now today, I'm not asking you to, to go to that person today until the Lord leads you to it. It might not be a safe in situation. I understand that. But right now, you need to let go of that. You need to release that person. Leave it at the cross. See, there's so many reasons, friends, that you wanted to come to church today. Maybe you wanted to meet new friends. You heard there was a guest speaker. You wanted to hear the guest speaker. Maybe you wanted to get your kids connected. You wanted many different things. But our greatest need is forgiveness today.